This program was created by Steve Schmidt and presented to a Zoom audience on January 17, 2024. So I'm, my name is Steve Schmidt. I'm the program's committee chairman for the Historical Society. And I do a lot of things, docenting, help with security. Um, but I'm personally very interested in our industrial history. I've written articles on Sunray Stove and put together programs uh, on the foundries in Delaware County and the rubber products manufacturing. And this is kind of the third one of those where I wanted to focus on the kind of the industrial area in Stratford, which was the south end of Stratford. And it's, you know, we know it about the mill, the mills that were there, but it had a history beyond that. So I kind of wanted to dig into that. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, got quite a few slides to go through and a lot of sources of information I'd suggest. If you, and I'm hoping people will uh, recognize names or bring back some memories. Um, I've seen some names pop up here checking in that I had posted on Facebook about questions about Stratford. So looking forward to any memories or comments you have, you can use the chat room for that. Uh, if you have questions, you can also type those in the chat room. And when we get to the end, we'll go through those and see what we can answer. So with that, I'm going to get started. So we're really going to cover kind of four eras. The uh, short era was the grist mill, which what started 1800 to 1830. And then for the rest of the 1800s, there were paper mills on that site. And then in the early part of the 1900s, the Columbus, Delaware and Marion Interurban had a power plant and cart maintenance at that site. And then from 1930 approximately to today, there were a number of businesses there that we'll talk about. So this is a 1866 view of the southern end of Delaware Township. Hang on a second. And you can see here's Stratford. This black is the housing that was if they platted Stratford. And this small bridge here connected what's now Pollock Road and US 23 to Stratford Road down to 315. And there was a small bridge that crossed here. And the town is 1866, so the town's been platted. And the church is right here with the cemetery behind it. This is a kind of current view from Google. We're looking at this area from just on the southern edge of the Route 23 bridge up here into the first three lots of Stratford. There's the uh, Turkey Hill and here's the Meeker Museum across the road. We're really talking about this area through here. This is a uh, a view of the from the auditor's website today of the performance automotive showing the three parcels here plus this uh, in lot number one from Stratford. So going back in time, the the first mill that was built there was built in 1807 by John Beard. It was built of logs and then Forrest Meeker bought it in 1811 and started improving it. He added machinery for carding and fulling wool in 1829. But then in 1836, he sold the whole property to a guy named Samuel Lance from Pennsylvania. And this is described in the 1880 history of Delaware County. Caleb Howard was a guy that worked for Forrest Meeker and had the idea of building a paper mill at the site. So he got Judge Hosea Williams to get in, involved with him and they purchased the flouring mill from Samuel Lance and they paid him $5,500 in 1838. They were equal partners in the, in the operation. Then, so they had the flouring mill, but then they built a new mill south of it uh, to produce writing paper. This was downstream. And Newton Perry came to Delaware with paper experience to superintend the erection and operation of the paper mill. They replaced the old dam with a stone structure and the mill started in 1839. 
the paper mill started. The flouring mill continued in operation. In 1840, a fire damaged the paper mill, but it was quickly rebuilt, and John Hoyt was the first superintendent. So paper making is basically combining fibers and then flattening them out to make paper. The main ingredients in those days, and this was from a the bottom, the Cincinnati Daily Star newspaper had a nice article back in 1879 about paper making. And it started with straw, which they cut it up and then used a fanning mail to separate the grain and dust just to get the fibers, then boiled and cleaned them. And then they rinsed that in water baths to get, and then chlorine was used to whiten it. And they let it sit 24 hours in bleach till it was white as snow and a mass of fine silky fibers. They could also use other plants like sorghum stalks were sometimes used. They would get different paper grades depending on what fiber source they used. Eventually wood pulp became the main ingredient for paper, but in the early days, they really didn't have good ways to extract fiber from the wood. So they still use some, but it wasn't the main ingredient. And there were specialist companies starting up that would shred the shred the trees and chemically get the fibers out, but that came really later. They also use a lot of rags. Um, I was actually reading a book to my grandson about the rag and bone man, because they had people that would go around in, in the cities and collect used rags, and those rags wound up getting bundled and shipped to paper mills where they would be used. They were cut up and sorted and they only used cotton and linen. They didn't use wool or any other fabrics. They would chop them up, boil and cleanse them in a solution of lime, and then basically follow the same thing as a straw to get a white fibrous pulp. And then they would mix those in equal parts and they would throw a little bit of clay in that would actually give a nice smooth surface on the writing paper. They would mix everything and then they would add blue coloring to get the best shade of white paper. And then let's put this in a large tub. And then they would take that tub and dispense into a machine. There were two types, a cylinder or a fordrenay. They would pour the pulp through a strainer where the water would, could rinse out, or could separate from the filters. It would vibrate so you would unite the filters in a flat, relatively flat sheet. Next, a sheet of paper would be carried over steam heated drying cylinders and then over cylinder rolls to give it its final gloss and finish. And then it's wrapped and ready to mark and ship. This is a good illustration of a four day uh, paper making mill. And I don't know that this is what they used in Stratford. The cylinder mill was another type. This was probably representative of what they might have been using. As we just described the process, the tank to the left has the pulp mixture, which starts to get dewatered here and then into the rolling mills where water's still dropping out. And then it starts going through the drying and finishing mills and finally is rolled up onto a paper roll. This again, as I said, I don't know what they used in Stratford, but it would have been something like this. So in 1844, Caleb Howard sold out his share in the, in the mill to Hiram Andrews. And then Norman Perry became a partner in the mill as well. Then in 1849, they converted the flowering mill, which is over here, the upstream, the north mill was converted to wrapping paper. And down south, here's the uh, finishing or the writing paper, printing paper mill south of there. This was the newer of the mills. They needed cleaner water for the process. So you drilled a 200 foot deep water well to get clean water to use for the process. And they were making about half a ton a day. Um, had 10 people working in the, in the facility. And about 1850, this is when they platted Stratford. Uh, for home sites for mill workers. But again, 1857, the paper mill was destroyed by fire, but it was rebuilt as a two-story building. And then in 1871, uh, J.H. Mendenhall purchased Andrew's half share. For some 
articles I found in the online Delaware Gazettes from the 1800s. Um, in 1859, they had produced and sold to the state $13,596 worth of paper. And then this was interesting. In 1860, there was an outbreak of smallpox. And people were no longer working at the mill, but they had been working there. And there was concern that they may have gotten the infection from handling the rags which were coming in from cities where smallpox was a problem. And then 1862, there's an article that says the uh, newsprint went up five cents uh, since last week. So a little bit like the inflation we have now, where well, it's quite a jump. And then lastly, there was an article about John Hoyt, who was a superintendent, had left Stratford and was going to Seneca County to convert a paper mill, mill to paper there. And it says that paper making at present ought to yield returns equal to the best California mines. So this was back during the gold rush. So make, making paper was supposed to be as good as gold mining. These are some photos from our historical society of the rebuilt paper mill. On the left, uh, you can see the, well, there's the one uh, chimney that was uh, used in the boilers for making the steam to do the drying. Um, here's some workers at the same time, supposedly about 1875. This is another photo where they've added onto this part of the building. And you can see down in here, there's a shed with rags stored here for feeding into the paper making process. So in early 1870s, Andrews and Perry were having financial issues. There was a panic of 1873 that may have been part of that. Um, in 1876, the Hills family, which were the four brothers, Chauncey, VT, Frank, and Fred, bought shares in the mills from various people and took control. They operated the mills until 1882, at which point they sold half of it to Nelson Mills and Charles Edsel for 11,000 and half to Joshua Randall for 14,000. Then Mills sold out um, his share and it wound up with Adam, Adam Glass and Charles Edsel bought Randall's share. So Adam Glass and Charles Edsel had the whole, comp whole company at that point. Add up what they paid, it was 35,000. It was Adam and Carrie Glass and Charles and Matta Edsel that included those. Remember back to the uh, car lots, there were two farm lots, 13 and 14, for a total of 21 and three quarter acres. And also Stratford lots one, two, and part of three. These were the platted lots. And then there was a separate one acre lot that I really couldn't tell where that was. They wound up transferring all this property to the company, to the new company, for 60000 So it's quite a jump in value. And this is a map from the 1895 Sanborn Fire Maps that shows the wrapping paper mill. This was the, north, the mill on the north end. This is the bit larger mill for printing paper at the south end. This is also the 1895 Sanborn fire map. And then, um, so yeah, that was a much more extensive operation. In 1891, the dispatch reported that Glass Edsel Paper Company was failing and blaming it on extensive and costly repairs to the mill and creditors were pressing for payment. An attorney, F.M. Marriott, was appointed to sell the properties and settle the debts for the company. It was interesting that at the auction, uh, sheriff's auction, Wilson Edsel, who was the father of Charles, wound up the high bidder for 34000 and bought the property. This was in 1895. Final owner, so in 1890, the wrapping paper mill closed and the printing mill was 
made mostly straw paper newsprint under the name the Delaware Paper Company. Um, Charles Edsel announced a leasing deal in 1894. The mill had been idle for two years. This was in the dispatch. And then the mill closed again in 1896. But I came across another note in the volume 20 of 1897 paper mill and wood pulp news that a guy named R.M. Scanlon in 1897 owned the mill and was considering a move to Portsmouth. It didn't say more than that, but so somebody they were trying to keep the mills going into the late 1890s. But I think that was the end. So this is interesting. Um, one of the things we have in our collection is Donna Meyer's great-grandmother had sat down to do an oral history back in 1946 with the, uh, I forget who it was, in the, in the Historical Society back then. And she was 84 at the time. And she and her sister had worked in the rag room where the rags were sorted, run through a cutter, bleached, and then washed. And her father, Jake Allen, counted papers and folded them into bundles. And then she said the, the finished paper was hauled by a wagon to Bunty Station on the Hawking Valley Railroad. I did come across an article, but then I couldn't find it again. But in the early 1870s, when the Hawking Valley Railroad was the Columbus and Toledo Railroad at the start, when it was being, in the early days, they had proposed running a siding, probably down Bunny Station Road to get down to the mills, but I don't, that never happened. One of the things uh, Ms. Marston commented on was how dangerous the work was. She had a cousin, Joshua Bowder, who fell into a, a tub of scalding bleach and, was, and died from that. And another cutter boy, Henry Breifogel, suffered the same fate. And there was other accidents, and it wasn't, a, it wasn't a safe place to work. But it's nice to have that oral history of what it was like working back then. So that's, that's kind of the end of the mill era. And then we're up to about 1902, which is called the interurban era. And this was the, uh, one of the last two steel interurban cars that the CDM bought before they closed. And I think this is the one that survived and is at the uh, Worthington Ohio Railway Museum, although it's I think a pretty bad repair again. It's been restored once already and it needs it again. So it started with the Columbus, Delaware and Northern Railway. And in 1901, Wilson and Clara Edsel, who had bought the whole property, sold it to Herbert Peck of Minneapolis for only 2000. So that went, he paid 34, it went to two. I don't know why, unless he also sold off the paper making equipment or something else that left just the uh, the land and the buildings. But it's kind of a, unusual to see it drop like that. And this was for the whole mill property. Remember, we talked about 21 acres plus the lots. This was for the whole thing. And then in 1902, Peck sold it to John Webb of Franklin County for two and a half thousand. In 1905, then, John and Glenna Webb sold the property to the railroad, Columbus, Delaware, and Northern Railroad. This was a new railway. And it was a smaller parcel, but it didn't list the acreage. Um, approximately went from the old highway bridge all the way up north to Lot 1 in between the turnpike and the river. But Webb, the two, um, the three parcels on the north end that were in lot two and parts of lots one and three in Stratford that he kept and then later sold to his brother James. Um, Webb and another guy, H.A. Fisher, were backers of the railway. Then in 1905, the CDM, Columbus, Delaware, Marion Electric Railway, bought the whole property for $5,064. That was our inner urban. This is a kind of a wide angle view we have looking to the east um, at Stratford Road is running left to right. Up here is the Meeker Barn and the Meeker House. Then this would be where the flowering mill was 
but that's where we'll see a pavilion was built plus a maintenance barn. And there were some more mill buildings and then the main paper mill would have been here, which is what the CDM converted to be a power plant to provide electricity for the inner urban cars. And then here's the Stratford church. And then down here is the Chris Tavern. When the CDM took ownership, so they demolished the upstream wrapping paper mill. This would be up north of this building. They built, they um, added a new barn, car barn, which did carpentry and paint maintenance. And that was beside the Stratford Road north of the power plant. And then this is the downstream paper mill, which they then converted to be their power plant. This is the 1911 from the Sanborn fire maps again. And there's the boiler operation up here, coal pile, the dynamo room, uh, machine shop, and then a car shed uh, with tracks coming in from the west side of the um, buildings. Another picture of the uh, inner urban car by the car barn, uh, maintenance barn. So the original CDM power plant had seven boilers for 2000 horsepower and it used 48 tons of coal per day. Um, there was one large steam turbine that generated 2000 kilowatts and a smaller one that was 800 kilowatts. It was an auxiliary steam turbine that they used mostly at night. And these ran the latest three phase general electric generators. It ran 24 hours a day. So they generated 2,300 volts AC and stepped it up to 19,000 volts, and then send it out to the substations, three substations, where it was stepped back down to 370 volts AC and then converted or rectified to 600 volts of DC, which was on the cat lines that the um, interurban cars would hook up to with their little catenaries. This information was all in the 1908 history of Delaware County by Lytle. So some pictures from our collection of the dynamo room here. I believe these are, there were no labels with these photos, but I believe those are transformers for um, stepping up the voltage. And then these are switches and meters. And then these are the generators or dynamos to generate the AC current. Uh, the CDM, and this was common a lot on all the inner urbans, or they would build party houses. Uh, there was one at Glen Mary down by Worthington. Um, they built a pavilion here at Stratford. And these were to give people a reason to ride the inner urban to go on the weekends or go on Sundays for parties and things. Um, it was on, it says it was on both sides of the river, but I'm not sure what, what was on the other side. This photo is on the mill side or the west side of the Olentangy. Um, it was only in operation for a few years. It had a dance floor, a stage, and a restaurant. Um, free to Columbus parties, it would rent a car for $35. Delaware residents could rent it for $10. Uh, but they had, people had to pay a nickel fare to ride to the park. Um, this information came out of a really good book, uh, Through the Heart of Ohio, it would be the history of the CDM. This article on the right came in the 1903 dispatch about a young men's driving club was expecting a good, good time at the Stratford Park on Wednesday, um, expecting five to 600 people, a uh, ball game and sports of an athletic character have been arranged. So this was uh, typical for the day. This is a postcard that shows the car barn and the power generation room. Um, there were five or seven, this must have been a later photo. As you'll see in these pictures, there's quite a change of the number of smokestacks. Most of them have five. This one's got an extra couple of them here. And then the original smokestack from the paper mill is no longer there. So it must have gotten taken down at some point. Stratford Road on the left here. 
This was a photograph of a guy named Chester Kroniger, whose family worked at the mill and lived in Stratford, wrote up a paper called Stratford and the River. Stratford and the River by Chester Kroniger. And this was a photograph in that collection uh, dated about 1918, from taken from Pollock Road, looking across the river. And as I said, you can see there's only five smokestacks at that point. Uh, this may be the old part of the old original smokestack. So dam is still over here from the uh, mill days. So, um, I found a really good website called www.columbusrailroads.com. Well, and it's got quite a few pictures of old US-23 with the CDM beside it. And in this photograph, we're coming north, northbound on US-23. And if we take a left across the bridge, that'll put us over to Stratford Road and on up into Delaware. If we go to veer to the right, that's Pollock Road. And you can see off in the distance is the CDM uh, power building with the five smokestacks. A little more of a close-up view showing the car barn and the power building up here. And then 1927, there was a large fire that completely destroyed the power plant and the car barn. At that point, they had already, CDM had already built a larger power plant in Prospect. So the one at Stratford was only being used for emergency power. They didn't manage to get passenger cars out of the building. The Delaware Fire Department responded. And apparently all they could really do was save the church across the road and some of the maintenance shops and other smaller buildings. But the it was basically a total loss. Um, the next day, CDM announced they weren't going to rebuild the power plant. At the same time, actually in the same same Delaware Gazette, um, ODOT, or whatever it was called at the time, State of Ohio and Delaware County agreed that this small bridge here was going to be replaced by a new highway bridge crossing the Olentangy and getting rid of these two 90 degree turns across the bridge. And that was announced uh, December 15th, 1927, but it didn't actually get built till 1950 when this aerial photo was taken. And you're looking south here. So this is Pollock Road. This is Stratford Road and, and 315 going here and Bundy Station Road. So we're looking southbound. And you see, this is still the maintenance car bar and survived the fire. This is where the, the, the buildings that burned would have been right here. Just a little aside about the bridge. So the small highway bridge um, was built in 1852 by David T. Sherman on abutments and piers of a, of a prior bridge. But in 1904, they took off the siding anticipating a flood. Um, and with the high water of the river, they thought they planned to take the siding off the covered bridge so the water could flow through and not destroy the bridge. And that worked, but they didn't put the siding back on. And the bridge deteriorated quickly. And by 1909, it had to come down, it was demolished. And Louis Dennison's Delaware Bridge and Iron Company replaced it with a new bridge. And that bridge lasted until the big 1913 flood, uh, which washed it away. It was replaced and that bridge lasted until the 1960s with the new highway bridge being built in the 1950s. Uh, this was a photo of the bridge after they took the siding off, uh, supposedly taken somewhere in 1904 to 1909 by Thomas Howald. Um, this information, David Simmons is one of our volunteers that very involved in, in uh, history of industry and bridges. And he wrote an article in a Bridges and Byways Journal of the Ohio Historic Bridge Association, which is where this information came from. Okay, so now it's 1929, 1930. The state of Ohio wants to re put a new bridge in. 
And this survey was done, shows that here's the brick car barn, the maintenance barn. Here's uh, the land where the paper mill had stood, where the interurban power station had stood. And that's gone now. As I said, this was, this was a 1929 survey after the 1927 fire. That was really the end of the line for the CDM. Um, in 1931, they, they sold three parcels of land from the, that area. They sold a, uh, the parcel for the bridge to the state of Ohio. And then there was a triangular parcel on the north side of the bridge that they sold to MR Swearingen. And the northern edge of that was in the deed transfer said the south wall of the old boiler room. Uh, Swearingen had been a motorman in the 1930 census for the electric railway. And then there was another very small parcel on the south side of the bridge that was sold to Raymond and Benita Deming Malloy, sometimes spelled Malloy. Um, in the 30, 1930 census, he was a grocery merchant. She was a grocery sales lady, and they, and they lived in Stratford. Then the, the CDM, as a company, got rolled into a new entity called Marion Reserve Power Company. Um, all the other Stratford CDM property was transferred to the Marion Reserve Power Company in 1936, and that was a 4.78 parcel that was extending from the filling station property line, which we'll see in a minute, to lot one. All right, so the Marion Reserve Power Company was started in 1936, and it included the CDM. It also included the Mount Gilead Water, Light, Heat, and Power Company and the Morrow Public Service Company. And it was controlled by the Manufacturers Trust of New York. And they continued to operate, even though the CDM shut down, they continued to operate the Prospect Power Plant generating electricity until 1969. And this was just on the, I think the north side of Prospect on Route 4. Marion Reserve Power still owned the 4.7 acre Stratford site. I don't know if they leased the car barn. I found this ad in 1938, the guy selling trailer coaches and it may have been a big enough operation to possibly he leased some room in the, uh, in the car barn. And Marion Reserve Power Company was incorporated into Ohio Public Services in 1946. Then they turned around and sold the 4.7 acre tract to the Red Eagle Corporation in 1950. And then eventually Ohio Public Services, I think had a few name changes, but it wound up being Ohio Edison Electric um, later on. So again, this is the current view of the site. This is Performance Automotive. The used car facilities up here, their main building, and then the, all the cars that are for sale. So what I want to talk about is after the CDM shut down, you know, what happened with each of those parcels. So we have the 3.79 acre that was owned by Red Eagle that included the car barn with the carpenter and paint shop. There was a almost a one acre parcel that was sold by Red Eagle to Ben and Lois Lehman. It's on the north side. And then on the south side, there was a, a triangular 0.7 acre parcel sold to Swearingen. And then the small part, a small parcel that was sold to the Malloys. And then I also want to go back up, talk about it, the lots on the north end that were sold to James Webb in lot two and parts of one and three. Now we have a couple of slides at the end with a bonus. All right, um, this is a 1950 Sanborn fire map and it shows the area we're gonna talk about, which is really the three point or 4.7 acre, which extended up into in lot one. It shows a filling station down here in the triangle. And it shows here dairy trucks stored in the car barn. And I don't know, I couldn't find anything about that. You know, Divco was making 
dairy trucks at that time. Potentially, they had leased it for storage. It was still owned by Ohio Edison at that point. You can see US-23 has not been taken up to the northwest, up to Delaware yet, so you're still using Stratford Road. So Red Eagle was a construction company headquartered in Columbus, and they bought the 4.7 acre parcel um, in 1950. And it was, they used the car barn to store construction equipment. And in 1951, they sold the one acre parcel up north to Ben Lehman of Berkeley, Michigan. So they, they wound up with a 3.79 acre parcel. And then in 1951, this article in the dispatch talks about them starting a new company there called the Delstrat Corporation, which would do machine castings and general machine and fabrication work. And the guy, O.D. Jackson, was the president. And Red Eagle was a stockholder in the company. And, but they owned the property. Um, I also found in 1952 a marriage notice about a guy named Richard Ward of Delaware who was engaged to be married and is with the Dell Strat Machine Company. Looking through the, I think Clarence Hartzler over here was a Delaware guy, but I don't recognize many of these other names as far as being Delaware people. And in 1961, the Buckeye Union Casualty Company bought the property at a sheriff's auction for 30,000, where it had been valued by 45,000, according to the Gazette. Then they sold the Buyer Circle Investments, who then sold at the Mid Ohio Metal Products in 1964. And then in 1967, they transferred it to Helen and Andrew Stomberg. Um, and there was an agreement between Mid Ohio and Fiberglass Plastics, Inc. And they were the Sombergs were the principals in that company. And they were going to do manual and press molding of reinforced plastics as well as machining services. So I expect they must have kept the machining um, equipment from um, Dell Strat at that point. And then Jackie Smith, on in response to a question on Facebook, remembered that they made buckets for bucket trucks. And of course, we had Skyworker in Delaware on London Road that and they may have been a client for these buckets, would have made sense. In 1977, there was a large fire that completely destroyed the, the original car barn, which had the fiberglass production in it. Um, there was a block wall, so the machine shop was saved. That would be in this picture, the machine shop would be here, but the car barn to the north was completely burned. And the Gazette article said the um, fire department had to go down to the Methodist Theological School to get water as there were no hydrants in Stratford and they couldn't get to the river to get water out. This is in January. And they couldn't get water out of the river. There's some photos from the, our collection and also from the Delaware Gazette at the time. In 1979, Helen Stomberg transferred the parcel to Andrew, and then in 1985, the Riverbend Partners made a mortgage with Andrew, and on the same day, Andrew sold the parcel to Riverbend Partners. So that's, that's the, uh, for now, that's the 3.79 acre parcel that had the car barn on it. Then the Southern, which I call the triangle, there was a, uh, this portion of the, this parcel was shaped triangular. This is a survey that was done in 1985. And we'll see some of these names, Artesian Inn Incorporated is named here, but this was done when River um, Riverbed Properties bought this parcel. They, you know, they just bought the one above us that we just talked about, this one. Now that they end up buying this, but we'll talk how they get there. So this is another aerial view looking to the northeast. And this triangular parcel is here. And this is when the bridge was being built. And I really can't tell if there's anything over there. But there was a filling station later. 
So the ownership of that went from Swearingen to 1945. And I'm going to quickly go through this. I don't know much about these people. Um, maybe in the comments, if somebody does know about them, they can say something. But Crow, Schweitzer, Larison, and Nicholas. I don't know if that's Jack Nicholas's family. Um, Weirs, Craners, Norris, and then Peter Berg in 1955. So changed hands quite a few times. And here are some ads that I found in the dispatch related to selling this. I think these are related to this property. Sometimes it's hard to tell. Actually, there, we'll get to it. There's a Riverview restaurant here. And here was an ad in 1949 selling a Chrysler New Yorker at the Riverview restaurant. So you can see in 37, they're saying it's a potential place for a filling station with living quarters. So. And this is a really interesting ODOT photo that and Gene Seeley had given me a copy of this. The new bridge is done, so this is after 1950. This would be a filling station that's in the triangular parcel we're looking at right now. So it'd be on, if you're going down Stratford Road, it's on your left as you get to the bridge. Gene is going down this side. Now, Vicki Tilton is the daughter of Joan Smale Tilton and niece of Jean Smale Seeley. They sent me some pictures. This was one of Joan Smale standing in front of the filling station. I think this would be the one that was on um, in this triangular parcel. And there's that 1950 Sanborn map again. It was quite a busy place. You've got the restaurant and a filling station. Here you've got a filling station. North of here on Stratford Road at McKee's Garage is another filling station. And if you go south on 315 at Bunny Station, which is now Gabby's place, you had a fourth filling station. So there was a lot of business going on at this intersection. So again, we're still talking about that triangular and we start to get more information from 1955 to 1959, John and Mary Dove owned it. And the 1958 county directory showed a marathon station and Riverside restaurant located there. Then 59 to 78, it was owned by Rita and Victor Emanuel. And they, um, in the 61 county directory, it was Sunoco and Kiros restaurant. And then 1978 to 85, it was the Artesian Inn Incorporated owned it. Um, a guy named Richard Horner was. Uh, involved with, it was a Columbus company. And Linda Penzera, who I think's on the, uh, I think I saw her name pop up, uh, remembered there was a tavern called The Artesian. Then there was in 85, it became Stratford Inn Incorporated. And that's, we'll be talking later about a Stratford Inn, but it's not the same one. So on the triangle lot, it was Stratford Inn Incorporated and it was owned by Joan and Richard Halley. And another Facebook memory, Dick Crookshank remembered that Mike Halley's parents operated the restaurant on the site. But then again, in 1985, uh, Riverman Partners, Allman and Smiley, who, lived, who were located in Dublin, bought the property. So now Riverman Partners owns both the triangle and the, and the parcel north of it. And here's a 1979 aerial view of that parcel showing the restaurant and six cabins here and back in the 50s my mother was while she was at ohio wesleyan was working for a professor at perkins observatory and she would sneak down here to get her dinner with a nice greasy hamburger so but she she doesn't she's 90 she doesn't really remember much of this she remembers the hamburger though uh the vintage aerials is a really interesting website there's a lot of photographs and they don't always know what they are so they're always asking people to look at them and comment on if you recognize something so someone had recognized this and uh, they had labeled it as a riverview restaurant riverview inn here's some more ads related to this site in 1945 i think they're looking to sell it in 1950 1951 and then don devault our auctioneer and realist, realtor 
uh, then 1956 is for sale. This was interesting. I remember we talked about Victor Emmanuel and Kiros. So in 1960, he was robbed. Um, they actually said before leaving, they took the ring from Victor Emmanuel, owner of the restaurant, and cut the wires on the telephone. So this is 1960 in November. In May, he's trying to sell it. And then in September 1961, he gets robbed again for $515. So it may not have been a really good site. So Riverbend Properties owned both of those parcels. Um, they wound up being transferred to Columbus Finance in 85. And then somewhere there may have been some transfers that I couldn't find. But in 1991, it went to the American Home Foundation. And then Jim Pancake and Albert Coughlin bought them, both of them, from the American Home Foundation. And this is Jim Pancake. So in 1991, you know, he had carriage down, was on South Sandusky Street in Delaware, the old Driggs Plymouth location. And in the article, he noted that they were consolidating at that site, but he planned to move to Stratford in 1992. In 1994, the Coglins sold the transfer of the property to Jim and his wife Patricia. And then in 1999, they were divorced and she was transferring it to Jim Pancake. There's a photo of him as he's getting ready to merge the properties on South Sandusky. And Jeannie Ball and Jean Sealer were telling me that the, um, the residents of Stratford did not want an auto dealership there and they tried to fight it. Uh, there, had, there was a zoning change that had to be approved and what they wanted to do was put in a park and ride for commuters to Columbus. Um, but there are some, you know, for the details or some kind of a technicality. In any case, the the zoning change was approved, and Jim Pancake wound up building the dealership there. So those are the two two parcels we talked about. The third parcel was the one acre, almost an acre parcel that was on the north side, and that had been a, the mill boarding house. So we're going to talk about that next. So this was the estate of Paul Lehman. This was the, the uh, survey that was done then. And it shows, this is, the, this is Stratford's lot one. So this parcel included part of lot one and part of the farm lot below it. And it was interesting in 19, so this is these old lot lines. Originally the CDM, and the mills owned the land between these lots and the river. But in 1952, Ohio Edison went through and transferred all of these parcels to the people that owned the lots here. So their lots then extended all the way down to the Olentangy River. And here's another view showing where it sat with respect to the rest of Stratford. Originally, a 12 room boarding house for mill workers was owned by the mills. And this is a picture Vicki Tilton sent me that's got Joan and, and Jean, the two sisters, in front of the two story house. And they were renting it. This was in the 1940s when they were renting it from Ohio Edison Electric. And looking up the road here, this is Stratford Road going north. And Jean said at some point, the second story was removed and it became just a six room house. I don't know when that was. And then a couple more pictures. This is Joan with her uncle Clarence K. Smail. And then Joan in front of the house again, other views of the boarding house. So the ownership of that property it went from Lehman, Red Eagle to Lehman to Kenneth and Ruth Gooding, to the Coverts, and then for many years, Lucy Orlowski, and then in 1999, she sold it to Jim Pancake. And that's where they built the used car, the used car building is where that lot where is on that parcel now. And there's a picture of Carriage Town Motors.
2014, he sold out to Automax Property Holdings. And then 2015, an uh, organization called Four Each purchased it, which is like Bruce Daniels that's involved with Honda Marysville and several other dealerships. Um, is the principal for that. And Performance Chrysler, Jeep Dodge Ram of Delaware is on the site. And I would like to shout, give them a shout out. They've been very supportive of us providing when we've done the Several years ago, we did the driving tour of Stratford. They loaned us a couple of vans to use to shuttle people back and forth. So they've been very supportive of the historical society. Okay, so that's uh, three parcels we've covered. Um, next, I wanna go to this little parcel on the south edge of what would be the Route 23 bridge that was originally sold by the CDM to the Malloys. It's a small parcel, about 0.15 acres. Um, and these two buildings down here, here's one and here's the other. This was the, the two buildings on the parcel. It's a filling station and a restaurant, and they show up in the 1923 uh, fire map. Gene Seely remembered this building here. I think we'll see another picture of it. She remembered dancing on the back porch in that building. There's another view from the fire map. There's a small filling station here and then a restaurant. And over here, I, I mentioned the, the other Stratford Inn. So this was a building that had three rooms in it. Well, I should say it had, later on, it had three apartments. And I don't know if those were the original, the way it was configured prior to being, if it was an inn. But in any case, that was a Stratford Inn. And when you read the, the county directories, it clearly calls it the Stratford Inn. And then across the street was the restaurant and filling station. I think these were all related to each other. And then down here is the Chris Tavern, um, which is south of the Stratford Inn. That photo we saw before with the filling station on the east side of the road, and this is now looking down 315. So I think this is where Gene Seely remember dancing back here on the porch. Um, there's a filling station here, um, and this is another ODOT photo that's available on their website. You see the 1950-ish, the bridge is done, so it's after 1950, but still have CDM tracks over here on the right. This is another uh, photo coming up. Uh, Route 23, so you're looking north, Pollock Road is on the right, the old US 23 bridge is on the right. It's after 1927 because the power, uh, bar, the car barn is gone. But this building is still over here on 315 that we just looked at and the gas station is in here. And again, this comes from the uh, <coughs> columbusrailroads.com website. Uh, I think he said these were originally ODOT photos. I looked up all their brothers' garage, and they were located on Spring Street in uh, Delaware. So I thought maybe they were here in Stratford, but not. Parcel, like I said, Malloy's bought it from the CDM in 1932, and they were employed as grocery. They were 35, and they owned their own home. Another thing was in 1927, they had bought a quarter-acre parcel <laughs> with 81 foot of frontage on Pollock Road between the river and the road from Emma Vaught. So they owned that quarter acre parcel and the 0.15 acre parcel on 315. And they sold both of them in 1933. And then it went through a number of owners until 1950. And then there's an ad from RF Malloy for sale or lease Stratford Tavern nightclub. This was in 1936. So that was dated back quite a ways. And then I think this was also the same. Uh, just, sorry, some of these ads are a little hard to figure out which one they're talking about. 1948, um, it got transferred to Henry and Hester Conley. But this was an interesting one because it said that it was the parcel between US 23 and Ohio 315 known as Mom's Place. And Gene Seeley had never heard of it referred to as Mom's Place. So that's a little bit of a mystery. Uh, it's only a one, 
0.15 acres, but the transfer didn't include the parcel on Pollock Road. I have not been able to figure out what happened to that parcel. Um, sold it to Arthur Warner and Edna Vest, and at that point it became 3.26 acres. So I don't still can't figure out how the parcel grew, but apparently it got larger. Um, and then they sold um, to Edna, I don't know what got. I think Warner sold out to Edna Vest, and that was a half a half interest in the property. So Edna C and Dewey Vest owned the property at that point. And in 49, they sold it to Howard and Mary Lloyd. But I think that's where Dewey Vest was accused of embezzlement from um, somewhere in Clay County, Missouri. But he mentions that he owns this restaurant and service station um, <coughs> at the corner of US 23 and Ohio 315. So um, that was interesting. It was 1949. Now, in 1950, the Denham and Vesta Meinhardt bought the property, and there are a number of ads that showed up in the 1954 dispatch, 1955 dispatch, looking for uh, people to help with the Stratford Inn with the uh, cook and living quarters. Um, They lived in Stratford. They lived on on Route 4 at Stratford Road. They owned, um, the Meinharts had owned quite a large tract of land west of 315, north of Bunny Station Road, and they had developed part of that land. Um, and instead of 1950, they granted an easement to the state for 13,800 for the um, highway to use that parcel. But then in 1970, they sold that 0.326 acre parcel plus across 315, 16.74 acres. Well, that was, yeah, that, um, that Vesta Meyer was a widow at that point, sold that property to Champ and Shirley Smith, and that included the Chris Tavern, which Champ and Shirley Smith, Stratford Inn, which Champ, and I don't know if he did it, but by then in the 70s, those were being rented as apartments. And that 3.326 acre now is owned by the state of Ohio, but I couldn't find or figure out when that actually or who sold it to the state or how that worked. And how if it was related to Meinhart, he gave an easement, but it turned out, but still sold that property to Champ in 1970. So just still a little bit of a mystery there. But a lot of people remembered that as being Meinhart's uh, name of the restaurant there. It was a great place. So it was a Stratford Inn, but I think right before it was sold to Champ and Shirley, it was also called Pines Motel. And here are a couple of views, um, again, from Vintage Ariel. And Chris, the Chris Tavern is down here to the left, and the church would be up here, right here to the right. And this building, I guess it's pretty much fallen down, but it's still back there hidden by trees. would have been where the restaurant would have been, which is now part of the highway as of 1979. And last, um, so remember the Stratford, there's, there were three parcels here. This one was part lot one, part lot two. This one was all lot two, and this one was part lot two and part of lot three that were owned by the mills and but then the Peck sale to John Webb, but he turned around, sold them to his brother James, who sold them to the Hedricks in 1911. And then they, uh, they Beulah, sold them to Oliver in May in 1916, and then they started selling these off. But they, up till then, they were all lumped together. This was a picture of the, the first house. This would be the first house north of the boarding house that we saw earlier. So it's on lot one and lot two. Um, it was sold in 1937 to the Evans and then to Morris and Merle Ray. And as I said, 1952, they extended that lot down to the river. 
1969 now it's owned by a guy Keith Ray and this is Ellen Smale uh, who's her cousin Jean and Joan's cousin but I was talking to my mother and she remembers she and Ellen double dated with two guys from Kenyon one of which became my father so it's kind of a small world but that's the house that was sitting on there it's still there um, there's a couple pictures of it and behind it was the Stratford Fire Department. And I really couldn't figure out from the deeds how that was owned or what was done with that. But in 1969, Keith Ray had his OK welding shop there and then eventually uh, was converted into a house. The fire department became a house. There's some pictures of the old, when it was the fire department with Thurman Evans. Remember the Evans uh, owned one of the houses was the chief, Esther Evans, and James Blinn, people with the fire department. And then the next lot north was all in lot two, and this was the garage that's still there. Um, initially, it was just the west part of the lot. Um, it was Ross McKee's garage from 1934 to 1943, when I think he moved to his operation up to Delaware. In 1938, the people that owned the lot north transferred the back half of that this lot to him with the stipulation that he clean up all the rubbish and take better care of the property. This was kind of a mess. Um, and then Charles and Ruthella Johnson owned it in 1945 and also owned the house, the next house north of it. Warren Maxwell and George Pyatt having a soda. And this is the building today, or reasonably, re recently. And in 1946 to 1945, owned by Mary C. Ray. And there was an ad in 1946 for uh, selling an Indian motorcycle at, at Ray's garage. And Gene Seeley remembered Bob Ray having that bike. So that was interesting. And again, they extended the parcel of land down to the river. And then 55 to 67, George Long, and the Long Excavating Company owned it, and it's currently owned by Long Real Estate. This is the third parcel that's on lots two and three. Uh, it was owned by May Hedrick till 1921, sold it through the Congers, and then there was a sheriff's auction. Um, and Frank and Minnie Walker owned it from 1940 to 1944. And then the Johnsons that we just talked about owned this, but they also owned the garage. And here's an ad in 1946 where they're trying to sell both of them, the double stone house. This house was originally a duplex. Um, current owner was, well, Arthur and Evelyn Berry lived in it for a long time and then sold to Sherry Clark, who's the current owner. And it's combined into a single family uh, house now or a single home. So those are the five parcels I wanted to talk about that were the original Stratford Mill site. And then just uh, as a bonus, just down the road on 315, there was Gabby's, it's now Gabby's place, but there's a photo in 1935. And it's on the back of the photo is that Uncle Charles and Aunt Beth service station, Stratford 1935. Uh, that was Charles and Beth Lawton. And then later it was Melson's Grocery and Melson's Grocery, Melson's General Store, Melson's Grocery, b and Carry Out. It's currently Gabby's Place. And here's an ad from 1941 offering to sell it. Um, this one was kind of clear with a six-room house, and none of the other filling stations had a house. Like, sure about this ad from night or this article from 1933, which gas station that was. It might have been this one. Um, but it was interesting. There were still robberies back then going, going through there. A real photo of that from 1979 of Gabby's place. And then another view looking down 315 that's not dated. And the last thing, I had never seen this picture before, but this was the Stratford Schoolhouse, which is up on the north end, which is where Gene and Jake Ball live now. And it shows the, the uh, suspension bridge going across the river so the kids from the other side can get to the schoolhouse and here's another picture of that and then at one point that was disassembled and 
moved over to Mill Creek over at Bell Fountain. And it's it's private property, and I think the some of the guts of it are still there, but it's pretty much gone. And then here's an ad for uh, this house. This schoolhouse had been the uh, Strom's meat market at one point, and it's selling a clean cut um, saw from the Stratford meat market. And that was in the uh, schoolhouse before Gene and Jake owned it. That's my program. I've got um, kind of a lot of sources, the recorder's office, the auditor, all the deep online deed transfer records, our historical society collection. The Union County has all the atlases and maps online. The fire maps you can get at Library of Congress or the Columbus Library has them. The gazettes or certain years are online at the Library of Congress. We have Ohio Memories has the Delaware Journal Heralds, Daily Journal Heralds on and so on. Many of these I've talked, I had an interview with Gene Seeley and Gene Ball about their remembrances of uh, Stratford and Nikki gave me a number of their photographs and you saw I've referenced some other people on Facebook that have made comments. Um, so, I think that's my last slide, so I'm going to stop sharing. Very interesting. Thank you for putting it together. Thank you. It was, uh, I've always been interested. I saw the fire in 1977, so I was spending the night across the road in one of Champ Smith's apartments. So I was, I was always interested in what the story was with that car barn, and I hadn't realized there had been a whole other... I always thought that was the CDM, and I didn't realize there had been the one that burned in 1927. So mm -hmm. let's take a look at the chat room and see. Thank you very much. I appreciate right. uh, your letting us uh, see this uh, fruit of your labor and looking back through all these records and uh, very, very interesting things. Thank you. Great. All right. Thank you. Did they bring back any memories for people of? You know, I, all the years I drove through there, like commuting to Ohio State on 315, I I just don't recollect the cabins that, if they were there in 1979, I had to drive by them all the time. I just, I just don't have any memories of those. I'm looking at the one comment, is the current narrow concrete, the old inner urban bridge? For a long time, the piers were in the river, but when they took out the low head dam, they also took out all those piers. So there's really nothing. I think some of the abutments are still there that you can see really from the river, not so much from the roads, I don't think. Steve? Yes. This is Tim. I asked the question. Uh, there is a concrete, narrow concrete bridge that goes across the river that you can see from Pollock Road. And I wondered, well, what was that that? The original bridge that you were talking about? Oh, I, I, I think you're, I think that's the water line or the sewer line. I think. Oh. I think that's. I think that's just carrying a water line across the river. Oh, it looked narrow enough to be like an interurban bridge. That's what led me to that question. No, I think that's just a pipe. I think that's where they had. That's why the theological school had water because they ran a pipe down to it when they built it. Well, it, it's it's all squared up concrete. It makes it yeah. look like a bridge. <laughs> it's kind of like the Delaware run when it goes under the railroad tracks at Blue Limestone. You know, they did that too, where they built it all out of concrete and we could ride our bicycles across the top of it. Uh, thanks. Yeah, sure. Steve? Um, yes. Okay, so one of the things you didn't mention at all, and it's more modern than some of that, is that I remember a little bitty house that sat right along the river south of where 23 and 315 come together and it's not there anymore um there was a, a husband and wife that lived there i would say like mid 80s maybe late 80s yeah and i i always wondered if that house had always been there or whether that was a newer one it was eventually torn down i would say probably by certainly by 2000 do you know anything about that there was a guy that was um if I heard his name, I would know it, but I can't bring it to my mind. He eventually moved and, and built a house, oh, maybe a half mile up on Bunny Station when they left there. 
but I didn't you know it, it always seemed like a very strange place because they had the bridge over their head almost and just this little um, sliver of land yeah there was a um so there was one parcel south of what was later mine hearts and way back on that um guy named Price owned that, and one of them referenced the wagon shop on that parcel. Um, but that wasn't part of the mill site. It was right on the south edge of the mill site. And I think that later on was a house. And there was a guy, and Susan, we we're trying to remember his name. He was like a, a township trustee or had something to do with the Delaware, and he had to live inside the township. So. Well, I, I, the only thing I can remember about him is that he was somehow involved in real estate, like a like a realtor. Um, okay. I, I just wondered if, you, I wondered if you um, knew anything about that house, how it how it came to be there for one thing, and um, and if you remember the name of the person there. No, I I just remember there was there was a guy living there who had to live inside the township. Okay. I can't think of his name. And Susan was saying you drove past there quite a bit, right, Susan? Yeah, I did drive past there, and I was told that it was jo I think John Young, who was a trustee in Delaware Township, and he had to have property there. I don't think I ever noticed uh, any activity. In the, on that site when I was sitting waiting for the light. Well, you really couldn't see it very well except from 315. And right. Then, even there, there was a lot of um, trees that blocked your view. Yeah. You really, most of the time, wouldn't know it was there. I just thought it was a very strange place to live. Well, I did too, but I have a feeling that actually you may be talking about a place a little further south than that intersection. Uh, it was south of the intersection, but just, yeah. it yeah. was more, it was um, almost across from the uh, Chris Tavern, but a little, let's see, that would be probably a little further south of the Chris Tavern, but not much, but on the mm -hmm. other side of the street. One of the things that uh, Steve didn't mention is on the um, eight, one of the maps we have, uh, Probably, well, definitely prior than to 1875, there was a sawmill down there right across from the Chris Tavern or maybe a little further south of there. Um, and I don't think uh, any of us have looked at that. No, I don't remember that being there. Well, 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 that was 150 years ago. No, I really don't remember <laughs> it. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> hey Steve hey Steve can you hear me yeah Donna Meyer here maybe Susan can answer this question but wasn't there like a nursery or a greenhouse was it Breeze's somewhere in that area um, Breeze's was quite a bit further south um, on, it was on 315 Okay. Uh, it, it was um, um, on the east side of 315 and about three or four new houses went in there. Um, it, was, it was south of, of um, Olentangy View. Um, okay. Okay. Um, but there was also a nursery uh, north of Meeker Way um, between... Uh, between Stratford Road and 23, and I'd forgotten the name of that nursery. Uh, the oh, nursery yeah. was on the west side of the of, of uh, Stratford Road, and um, the the owner's house was on the east side. And it's I think it could be the house just north of the mill worker house. So, thank, thank you. Good job, Steve. Ah, thank you. It was kind of confusing all those uh, restaurants trying to get the names of which ones were which. So, <laughs> well, it looks like you did a ton of research. So, I've been, I've been working on this since last fall, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have, and it shows.
Anybody remember those restaurants that went eating there or anything like that? You'd have to be probably uh, well 85 to 90 to have yeah, had the opportunity yeah. to, <laughs> to do Well, that. my mom's 90, so yeah, so <laughs> she was in college when those were going. So. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Stay warm. <laughs> Thank you.